Part of the Bible study curriculum at camp this summer has been a conversation about idols. I say to these kids who range in age generally from six or so to about 16, what are idols? What does it mean that something is an idol? And almost all of the kids at one point or another talk about American Idol. Pop stars are popular idols for these children. Some of them talk about people to whom they look up, their parents, their pastors, people they admire and respect and desire to emulate. And some are even sharp enough that they talk about things that people worship. And consistently, every week this summer, someone has been on the ball enough to say, money is an idol. Or, and I love the way the kids say it with this, this real push behind it, stuff. Stuff is a popular idol. And it's been pleasant to know reliably that these children, these young people, are listening to their parents and their Bible study leaders and their Sunday school teachers. They're listening. I talk to the kids about idolatry because idolatry is rampant. It is a systemic disease, not just in our communities here in New York City's greater metro area, not just in New York State, not just in the United States, not just in North America, but everywhere in the world, idolatry is a rampant, consistent, and continuous problem. An enormous number of people yield up their daily worship to idols, political, social, economic, personal idols. People worship ideologies and belief systems, People worship sports teams, musicians, actors, and actresses. People worship an absolutely astounding array of things. But we are particularly prone in our nation because of the confluences of history, because of the forces that have been brought, brought to bear upon us, and because of our own mythology. We, as Americans, are particularly prone to worship money and stuff. Possessions and the ability to acquire more possessions. From an early age, we are taught, I remember this so well, we are taught that our participation matters. We are taught that it is important to go to the store and buy your groceries and to, to go to Best Buy and buy a television. This is a thing that Americans do. We buy. We buy together. We buy in families. We spend money. I remember so well sitting in my parents' shopping cart at the commissary at the base being driven around and watching them fill this cart with stuff and being told, this is something we do together as a family. I remember family trips to Sears and J.C. Penney to shop for clothing. This is something we do together. It's important. It matters. Buying things is our patriotic duty, I learned later. It, as the news people say, it stimulates the economy. I don't know, sometimes I worry that the economy is a little overstimulated. It is a consumer economy. It is required, it is necessary for the system to run right that we all consume and consume and consume, that we buy and eat and watch and drink, that we swallow and are not nourished. Increasingly, it is an economy in our country that sees you not as actors, not as agents, not as people with free will. No, our economy increasingly sees you as a commodity. You, my friends, are for sale. Your life, your statistics, your buying habits, your interests all of them bought and sold daily by Google and Facebook and advertising agencies. You are the commodity. 
And the whole system works at its best if you just spend every penny of every paycheck boldly. Don't save. Don't pay down debts that you don't have to. Just, just, just spend that money. Go out on the town, see a show, buy a television. Everyone does better if you dive into debt daily to supply the things that you deserve. Just as this man, about whom Jesus talks, this wealthy man deserves his wealth. Notice, by the way, that he does. The scriptures do not indicate in any way that he is undeserving or unworthy of the wealth that he has required, of his bounteous harvest. He sowed, and he weeded, and he planted, and he cared for, he watered, he watched over his harvest. And it grew up bountifully. There's no reason to think that he was sitting back. No, it sounds like he was engaged on the task and he made a great deal of wealth and deservedly so if we judge by human standards. He has the right to spend it however he will. But, 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 even the most deserving of wealthy people, the ones who have toiled with their own hands, the ones who have not set out to screw their neighbors out of as much as they possibly could, the honest rich, the ones who do justice by their neighbors, even they would not, for that reason alone, escape Christ's condemnation here. If they were not, as Christ puts it, rich towards God. The conditional here spares us the full weight that Christ sometimes lays upon us. There is nothing, Christ says, natively wrong with being wealthy or even with being comfortable. I wish that more people worked and were comfortable because of it. I wish that more jobs paid living wages I wish that a lifetime of work earned for the deliberate person a restful retirement. I think we as a team, I think we as Americans can work on that. We can encourage and endorse solid, full-time work at living wages for people. We can try and make that happen. Because there's nothing wrong by itself with eating and drinking and being merry. There's nothing wrong with it. Ecclesiastes flat out encourages it. Ecclesiastes decries all work as vanity and meaninglessness and says, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you may die. But Ecclesiastes, recognizing the hollowness of all things, recognizing that food and drink and carousing are all well and good, Ecclesiastes still asks this question, where have you laid up your harvest? Where are your storehouses, your barns? Where is your treasure? My friends, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is here on earth, if it's in stocks or bonds or an IRA or in your house, if it's in a savings account or investments in gold or silver, if your treasure is here on earth, then when your heart's beats are numbered, your heart will stay with your treasures here on earth. And you will go down into the dust as all the treasures of the earth must also go down into the dust. But if your treasures are in heaven, 
If you have lain up for yourself barns and storehouses full of compassion, if you have warehouses full of charity, if your savings accounts and your IRAs and your retirements are bursting with the grace of Jesus Christ, we don't need to fear the reaper. Your heart will follow its treasures into the heavens. It's tempting to buy in to the account of our nation and our history. It's tempting because it's what our neighbors do and it's what we were taught as children. It's tempting to say, yes, I will be a consumer first. I will stimulate that economy. I will eat and drink and be merry and forget my neighbors and make it to church once a week and that'll be fine. That'll be enough. It's tempting. But I beseech you, I beg you, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Make yourself rich towards God. Invest your time and your energy and your money in the church, in the work of Christ in the world, that we might heal the brokenness. That we might be the hands and feet of Christ. That we might do Christ's work here and in this state and in this nation and in all the world. Invest in being rich towards God. By investing in the health of your neighbors and in the church. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 383. My faith looks up to thee. Let us stand together and sing.